And talking about big names, I suppose in recent years, if you'd asked anybody who is the greatest fighter in the world, they would probably have said Roy Jones. But somebody you can never overlook in that equation is Bernard Hopkins, approaching 40 now, but unbeaten for 11 years and the undisputed middleweight champion of the world. But how much longer can he stay at the top of the tree? On the mean streets of Philadelphia, he bumped into Steve. On these streets in North Philly, dreams end quickly. Life is cheap and people die too easily. For a man known simply as the executioner, he had to survive. He had to survive life in his ghetto. He had to survive life in prison. He wanted to change, to follow the right heroes, the few good men. He had to cross over. Under the bridge, over the tracks, separates flies from blacks. By the early 80s, there's lots of Bro, drugs. That was just an old crack yeah, epidemic. That helped, that helped uh, became uh, the era from the, uh, from the inner structure. Crack, um, heroin, things like that. That 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 played a role, and in, in, in the inside deterioration. But the biggest uh, plus I got is that I come from here, so I respect the ghetto. Were you in a street gang then, but were you just a solo operator? I never had a gang. I was just a, a solo operator. <laughs> um, uh, I had a, a, a respect um, on my own merit and on my own deeds. Even though them deeds was negative, I never had to have a form of people to create chaos. Um, I was a one-man army, um, highly respected. What about when you got stabbed? I mean, you're 13, you get stabbed, you're in hospital for three times. months. I mean, yeah, that's... a couple of times, uh, in the back. I mean, um, of course I wasn't looking. Most of them has always been like you had a crowded place and, you know, you get warned, but you turn around and you've already been stabbed. Was this the school yeah. you went to? Yeah, I went, at an early age, I went to this school. How you doing, man? Right. Yeah, I yeah, I didn't want before. this bus right in. There was a time when Hopkins was feared on the streets, avoided. But now even the principal at his old school accepts him. She knows he can do good. Back streets of America They kill the dream of America I came from this school. Young adults and people have to see that I am the undisputed middleweight champion of the world. Can you see the message You're that they send? I looked at my option as a felony, did five years, learned how to read and write in prison. My options were slim. Yeah. So I looked at I looked slim at, or I looked at, I looked at the upside and I looked at I looked at the um, downside. So I took the I took the side that I knew that I could do what I can do. The rumble. That's, sure. that's what the thing is. What's up, man? You alright? Good, good. All right. We can see train tracks. See the train tracks there? Yeah, yeah, commercial line. The train used to come from the district you can hear the horn. We used to be playing on there and they used to hit the train from a mile away, basically, half a mile away. To get your kids away. off the track. The older guys, what we call old heads in the neighborhood, they used to take a stick or a pole and derail the train. About 10, 15 guys would totally beat the people up and it's this, this hijack everything in there. Well, all the goods on the track. And everybody comes through with chairs, boxes, TVs, <laughs> whatever that track, whatever they had on it, whatever they had as cargo, was in these houses. I saw a couple of houses with Kerry and Edwards yeah. stickers in there. Yeah. Would there yeah. have been a decent amount of support here for the Democrats? Yeah, you ain't seen none of Bush, did you? No, I hope not. Yeah, this is Democratic what about City. You, what about you now? You've got your penthouse apartment, you've got your cars, you haven't got any Bush stickers in your house, have you? No, I'm not supposed to be supporting Bush because I got a little bit of money. That's what most people think. But I look at it like this, most of my family, sisters and brothers and aunts and uncles, they don't have what I have. They don't suffer from it. So that's why I, I, I want to carry the one. Did you get involved? Yeah, I got involved. I got involved. I mean, I was on the plane with Kerry. Um, for a day, I uh, spoke at rallies that was 25,000 plus people in, in a big audience. So yeah, I, I played a, a major role in the city of Philadelphia. I hurt myself today to see if I still feel. When cameras come around here, it ain't positive. They see a camera or a white person, 
There's a lot of, until, until they realize who it is, they didn't throw all their goods away in the toilet. So sometimes they gotta find out what the hell you're here for and, 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 and not, and, and not uh, uh, abandon everything that they might think they got. But it's crazy, I mean, it's the mindset, man. Okay, holler back at you. The only thing. School ended when he was real young. Crime started. Hopkins fit the description. He was the bad kid, the kid with no future. How many times then did you find yourself over there in Juvie Hall before the age of 17? Count. I can't count. I can tell you within a week, maybe about three times, between Monday and Sunday. That's only seven days. What age was that? 13, 14, completely? 12, 12 to 17, back and forth. Do you think going to prison at 17 saved your life? Going there, I could have got killed in prison. Yeah, you know, prison ain't a place where you go there and all of a sudden you're in a mass jail and you're in a church and you, everything is peaceful and everybody around know they made a mistake and everybody's shaking their hand greeting their good brother. You know what I mean? In prison, people got stabbed, people got killed, people got raped. So I had a better chance out here than being in prison because you can find amongst 4,000 men 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, you know, getting stabbed in the back or in the front or throw some battery acid in your face and burn your eyes off, uh, that was running rapid in those places. So, I mean, I think what we with Jill did is get myself mentally ready to, to, to do something different in my life. But even going there was just as dangerous as being on the street, just had a wall around it. And it's some people, some of your critics, who say that perhaps you dragged too much of that past baggage around with you. And that now that you've been a success for the last 10 years, perhaps you need to start forgetting about that past. Of course, somebody asks you, how's your day? I ain't a fanatic. I don't go say, well, I did five years in prison. The man asks you, how's your day? My day is fine. But when you start talking to me about, well, Bernard, um, when you start boxing, and when you should, I have to tie in. It does me a disservice and it does people that see me now with the Range Rover, with the Bentley, with the big house, with the penthouse. And you see me now and you say, well, life is good. Well, it is, but let me tell you about the other one. So what was it that opened your eyes or changed you in greater sense? I've seen gone. that the system was more geared to keep me in and let me out. It's over $50,000 a year to keep an inmate incarcerated. I'm not getting a dime of that. So somebody's benefiting off my ignorance. I've seen a situation where if I'm lazy mentally and physically, I have three hots in the car. They fed me three times. They changed my sheets every other day. At home, if you don't wash your sheets, if you don't go out and steal or rob or whatever you got to do or work to get money and get food, then you don't eat. But in incarceration, if you're lazy, you're ignorant. You don't make the efforts to go out and do for yourself. In jail, you get comfortable, you get institutionalized. You don't want to leave even they got the door open. So I chose not to be part of that system. So what about in a year when you walk away after 20 defenses and a big payday hopefully next summer? You only be 40, what you gonna do? I know I haven't been bored yet. I haven't been bored over 15 years. I'm talking about bored to the point where you'd be like, I'm tired of fishing. Even though I don't fish or, or whatever, I, I, mean, I try to play golf, but uh, uh, damn they reconstructed the field when I got done, smacking dirt out or grass <laughs> out of it. You thought a beaver got loose. Or, you know, holes you know, everywhere. Or, holes everywhere. So, I mean, I, I like to get in business-wise. Um, I like to get in real estate. I see how that could be a great investment, to get in some real estate. And I got a lot of credibility in this city, a lot of respect. And it ain't got nothing to do with boxing. That's just the sport part of it. It got something to do with me. You know, because they know that even though I don't have to be here, I'm still around. I ain't got no bodyguards with me. We walk around the streets. Look at this, look at the cops. Give me the X sign. <laughs> the cops give me that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this is it's the respect, man. I mean, you see the love and the respect from all kinds of people. People of color, all kinds of people, because they know the struggle that I had to go through to get here. So that's Bernard Hopkins, juvenile delinquent, hard time prisoner, a fighter, a proper hero on both sides of the ropes, 
A proper hero in a world of plastic sporting idols. Well, Richie, he may not have the charisma, if you like, of Felix Trinidad or De La Hoya, but he's one heck of a fighter, isn't he? Great fighter. John, when I was uh, a teenager back in the 80s as an amateur boxer, my heroes were Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Thomas Hearns and Roberto Duran, all at middleweight. It was such an exciting division. Over the last 15 years, I would say there's two fighters who could live with those fighters in the ring. That is Roy Jones Jr. and Bernard Hopkins. Without a doubt, I think, pound for pound, he's the best fighter in the world. So, what does he do now? Well, he's looking for his 20th fight, and you know what? We've been hearing rumours, and I can tell you, Mick Hennessy was out in Thailand at the WBC convention. He's fought two from now, and he's managed to get his man, Howard Eastman, in the fight with Hopkins. It'll be early next year, it'll be in America. Sounds like a joke, it's not. Trust me, it's going to happen. Okay, well, that sounds good. Let's go.